Um, I don't know how many Boy Scouts we have in the room, but you all deserve Explorer badges for finding your way to this room in this dreadful building. Uh, does anybody miss the mall as much as I miss it? Yeah. Um, Kai Bird is a friend of mine, a fairly recent vintage, but we lived about a mile each other from each other for much of each of the past three years in Lima, Peru. Um, we have a good view of the Atlantic, of the Pacific Ocean. Kai had an even better one. Um, it's been our remarkable good fortune this year to have two exceptionally good books uh, published about spies. Um, ben McIntyre's um, A Spy Among Friends is the story um, of um, Kim Philby, the, the, the British uh, citizen who betrayed not merely his country but the entire Western alliance to the Soviet Union. Uh, Kim Philby was the bad spy. Um, the good spy was Robert Ames, the, which is the title of, of Kai's extraordinary book. It tells a story that was first made, fam made familiar to a number of readers by my Washington Post colleague David Ignatius in his wonderful novel, Agents of Innocence. As David has said, Kai has found out so much more about the story, of, uh, the extraordinary story of Robert Ames than, than David himself was ab ever able to learn. Uh, I leave you in the, the very capable hands of Kai Bird. Thank you. It's really great to be here and to see John. Tomorrow he promises to make me a good Peruvian pisco sour. <laughs> um, and, and yes, I, my new book is called The Good Spy, The Life and Death of Robert Ames. And uh, he's not to be confused with Aldrich Ames, who is the bad spy, the other bad spy being Kim Philby. but. Uh, Ames was a completely unknown character. Uh, he joined the CIA in 1960 and was a clandestine officer, a man who recruited agents. Uh, he was a very good Arabist. He had posts in Dahran, Beirut, uh, Aden, Tehran, Kuwait. Uh, and he, unlike many CIA officers in the sort of the stereotype that we have, uh, you know, when the agency was created in 1948, it was largely populated by uh, blue bloods from Yale and Harvard and members of Skull and Bones, the secret societies at Yale. And, but Robert Ames came from a simple working class background. His father was a steel worker in Philadelphia. And he was a basketball star, tall, six, six foot three, handsome guy. And uh, he had none of that sort of sophisticated aristocratic background. Uh, he was very much a sort of Jimmy Stewart kind of all-American character. And I know this because he was my next door neighbor when I was 11, 12, and 13 years old in Dahran, Saudi Arabia, where my father was a foreign service officer and Ames was posted as his first um, posting abroad as a clandestine CIA officer. Of course, at the age of 13, I had no idea he was a spy. But my father, who actually should be here in the room someplace, is now 89, and at one point he, he confessed to me that Bob was actually a CIA officer. Um, and he had an extraordinary career. Inside the CIA, he is a legend for having penetrated the PLO in 1969, very early and creating a friendship relationship with uh, Yasser Arafat's uh, intelligence chief and chief bodyguard, a young man named Ali Hassan Salameh. And this friendship lasted for 10 years until Ali Hassan was assassinated by Israeli Mossad agents in Beirut in 1979. And then Ames himself died in Beirut in 1983 in the first big truck bomb attack on a U.S. embassy. Eight CIA officers were killed that day, uh, and a total of 17 Americans and 
40 odd more Lebanese civilians who happen to be walking by or applying for visas. And dozens of people were severely wounded and survived, including Anne Demerel, who I see is sitting here in the audience, who had, I think, 19 broken bones and numerous surgeries. And, and it was a terrible event. Um, usually I talk more about the whole book and sort of give you a synopsis of it, but today I'm, I'd like to sort of describe what it's like to try to write a spy book. Um, initially, I was not intending, I didn't think I could write a real biography of a clandestine CIA officer. Who was going to talk to me? Uh, where were the sources? Everything seemed to be classified. Um, so <clears throat> initially, I stumbled upon this idea, well, I'll, I'll do a book about the embassy bombing, which is largely forgotten. People sort of remember the Beirut, em the Beirut uh, uh, Marine barracks attack, where a truck bomb killed 241 Marines. But that took place in October 83, and the embassy bombing occurred six months before that, in April. And it's been large, largely forgotten, and uh, I started out th with this book on, on a whim. I googled Robert Ames's name, and up came a court case referencing a 2003 civil suit filed by Anne Demerell and Yvonne Ames, the widow of Robert Ames, in federal district court here in DC. And on my computer screen, sitting in Lima, Peru, where I was living at the time, uh, came this court records, very detailed testimony of, uh, by Yvonne Ames and her six children, um, very moving documentation of what happened that day in Beirut how all these people had lost their lives. And I thought, well, this is very vivid material. I can, you know, if I can't do a biography about Robert Ames, I can sort of do a history of the bombing and focus on him as one of the chief characters. So the first thing I did at, after deciding to engage on this book was to um, fly up here to Langley, Virginia, to the CIA headquarters, and I explained what I wanted to do write a biography of one of their great heroes. And I walked into the lobby there where there's a wall of stars, one of whom represented Robert Ames. Each star represents a fallen CIA officer. And they checked me through security. I had to surrender my cell phone. And then I went up to see George Little, then the public affairs officer for the CIA. And I explained to him, you know, that I was a biographer. He, he sort of knew, knew who I was, but I wanted to do this bio biography, but really a, a history of the embassy bombing. And all I asked for was a chance to maybe sit down with an in-house historian and go over some, check my facts and the chronology and get the right job titles that Ames had during his career and things like that. And, and George said, oh, this sounds like a plausible thing. Maybe we can arrange to do this. And, and then on my way out, I, I said, you know, to try to emphasize how, how much research I was already involved in, I, I reached into my backpack and pulled out an iPad and said, here, let me show the, you the pictures I've, I've uh, found already. And George kind of blanched. Apparently, I had broken CIA security by bringing in an iPad. <laughs> uh, but he, he nevertheless allowed me to uh, show him a few of the pictures that I had already found of Bob Ames. And, and indeed, by that time, I had found Yvonne, the widow. And I'd flown down to a small town in North Carolina where she lives in very simple circumstances in an old farmhouse. And I spent a day and a half with her, interviewing her, seeing her family album. She gave me some of these photographs. And we had a great interview. She, she remembered me from when I was 13, but we hadn't seen each other since.